Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave. This tutorial is part of a beginner CSS series. I'll be using the Chrome web browser, the Visual Studio Code editor, and the live server extension for Visual Studio Code to view the web page. There are links to these tools, starter code files, and all resources in the description below. Let's move on to CSS Flexbox Fundamentals. We'll be learning the CSS properties that you'll use most frequently when working with Flexbox. You can see I've got Visual Studio Code here on the left, and it's in a smaller window today. I've got a larger browser window here on the right. And I'll quickly look at the HTML file as well that we're starting out with, and this will be available in the source code that you can download. But we've just got six divs right here, and all of them have a class box, and then they each have their own number, as we see on the page one, two, three, four, five, and six. Divs are block elements, and so they're spanning the full width of the container, and they're stacked on top of each other, and you can see we have a main element with the class container as well. Okay, back inside of our CSS file, we're starting out by bringing in the Roboto font from Google Fonts. We've got a very basic CSS reset here at the top. On the body, we're setting up that Roboto font. We've got a min height of 100 viewport units, so it's the full screen or the full browser window. And then we've got padding of 20 pixels, so you see it pushing down our main container from the top, that 20 pixels here. It's also on the left, right, and bottom. It's just harder to see that. And then we have some styles on the container. So it's got a max width of 800 pixels, a minimum height of 400 pixels, margin inline set to auto. So it is centered horizontally here, and we should have the same amount of space on the left and the right. We've also got a black border going around the main container, but you really can't see that right now because the contents are black as well. And then the boxes, they have a min width and min height of 100 pixels. And remember, the boxes are the six divs. It's got a background color of black, a color of white that we see on the numbers. Font size is two rims, so the numbers are a little bigger. And just a little bit of padding of uh, 0.5 rim. And that's what we're starting out with for our code. But we're going to apply flex. And the area that we'll apply that to first is the container. We'll make our container a flex container. And as soon as we apply flex, I need to spell display properly, things will change on the page. So I will save. And now we see some big differences over here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six going horizontally instead of vertically, and they're not stacked on top of each other. So the divs are a min width of 100 pixels. So they're about 100 pixels wide each. And then their height is filling out the full 400 pixels we have for min height on our container. You can now see the border over here on the right side of the container at least. But they are now considered to be flex items. And so they're starting out at the position flex start, and that's where they default to in this alignment. So they're just all over here to the left. So let's look at how we can align these horizontally first. We're going to do that with the justify content property. And the place they're starting is called flex start. So we'll say flex start. And yes, I'm already wrapping the code. I pressed Alt Z in Visual Studio Code to do that. So we don't see any change. But what if we switch this to flex end and save? Well, now they're all over to the right instead of being all the way over to the left. Likewise, we can set this to flex center. And now they're all in the center. You know, let's go ahead and add another property here called gap. And we'll set this to one rim. And now look at what happens. We get a one rim gap between each flex item. So that helps us see each individual one just a little bit better. Now continuing with the justify content, there's some other good values worth looking into. Center is often used, but there's also space around. And now look at that. Now this isn't used as often and maybe you can see why. We've got some space between each one, but look, the space at the edges before the end and beginning of the container aren't quite as big. And also if we remove the gap now at this point, we should still see that space around evenly space everything out except at the beginning and the end. So what if we did the other one that we saw space between? 
Well, now there's no space at the beginning and no space at the end, but it's evenly spaced between all of the flex items. And then there is a little newer value that is much better to use. I think it was probably requested, and that is space evenly. So not only between the items, but also at the beginning and the end, we have evenly spaced the items throughout the container. Okay, I'm going to change this min height on our boxes to a height of 100 pixels so we can clearly see each box and some space in a vertical way because now we're going to align the items vertically as well. So we use justify content for horizontal as things are currently set to a row and that's why we use justify content for the horizontal. Now let's go ahead and align the items. So this would be the other axis and that's going to be vertically. So if we align the items to flex start, they're where they are by default, right at the top. But likewise, we can say flex end, and now all of the items are at the bottom. As you might guess, we could say flex, or align items center, and now they're centered vertically as well. Now we don't have the other options with align items like space around, space between, because if you think about it, it's only one item at a time when we're aligning the items. Horizontally here, we had six items in this row, but if we look vertically, we've just got one item for each alignment. So that's why we don't have the space options. Now we can change the direction as well. So let's look at flex direction, and by default, we're in a row. So we could say column. And now if we save, we've got all of our blocks stacked once again as a column. And remember, I removed that gap that we had, so there's no longer a space between them. And they're also taking up the full height of our container. Remember, our container has a min height of 400 pixels, but we've got at least 600 pixels worth of divs right here. So they're filling this up. So there's no extra space to space out as well. Now, if we go ahead and change something, let's change the align items and we'll see if you think we're going to get what we get. I will save. And now everything's to the left because our align items became the horizontal alignment. Again, just one item at a time instead of all six. All six are now on the vertical alignment. So by having flex end, they will all go to the right. And of course we were back at center and that put everything in the center. So if we change our justify content, we not, might not see much of a difference right now because we're taking up all that space. So if I said flex start, for example, it didn't really change. And that's because we're eating up all of the space of the container already. So there's no real change to notice. When we have this set with 600 pixels inside of a container where we're taking up all of the space. But if we change this to row, now we'll see our center where they're all together, once again with no gap whatsoever. If we wanted a gap, we could put our gap property back in and say one rim. And now we have that one rim gap between each one of these, but they're centered. Now, of course, if we change this back to space evenly, we might not want that gap property at all. Now, since we have the flex direction property in here, there's more that we can do than just row or column. What about row reverse? And if I save, notice now, six that was to the far right is now to the left. We reversed the order of the elements here. So row reverse is an option. And as you might guess, column reverse is also an option. Now let's look at one other property here. I can leave the row reversed for this for now. But what I need to do is drag this all the way over to take up the full screen and open up DevTools. And once we have DevTools here, we're going to notice something as I resize the window. The flex box row, our row of boxes, it's really not changing, it's outgrowing. It's not resizing or shrinking to stay inside of the container or the page. So that is considered an overflow. So there is a setting for that. Let me bring up Visual Studio Code again. And the setting that we could use is called flex-wrap. And so we would want to set that to wrap. And now if we save, 
and we have our dev tool still open in the window, you can see it wrapped into two rows. And we have it reversed. Now you might be surprised at this because six isn't at the top now, but our rows have reversed. So three is to the far left and one is to the right. Six is to the far left of row two and four is to the right. Now we could change this back, of course, to row see everything in the order that we would normally see it in one two three four five six and then there's also shorthand that we could use instead of flex direction and flex wrap and that would just be called flex flow so let me just select both of these and now we'll have flex flow and then the first is the direction so we'll say row the second value is wrap and now by default you noticed our row did not wrap. So the default value is no wrap, but we want it to wrap. So we'll set that. And now nothing should change about the page the way we had it. Let's see if I can resize just a little more here. And yep, we've got wrapping of the rows as it needs to. And it will even get down to just one column. And now we'll bring it back to two columns or three rows is what we should consider that since we have it set to rows. And there's Again, back to two rows and still two rows with this width because we've just got one square that carries down. I'll bring it back to about even here. And now that we've got that, this is shorthand. So remember, the first is the flex direction. The second is the flex wrap with flex flow. Okay, there's one more property to consider on our container. Remember, we're putting all of these properties on the flex container right now that I've outlined here with our one pixel black border. I'm going to scroll just a little for some more room here. Underneath, let's put align content. Now this aligns the rows. So you can see by default, we have two rows and they're spaced out here. There's some room between them. Now this will take values just like justify content, but it's aligning the rows. So we'll put in flex start first. And if we save, notice both our rows move up to the top. Likewise, flex end, move them both to the bottom, and flex, or not flex, just center, has them both in the center. So that wasn't the default either. What about space between that we could also use on justify content? Yep, it puts one on the top, one on the bottom. Space around, so that's a little different as well. And then space evenly that we might like, if I could spell evenly once again, and save. And yes, that changed the alignment just a little bit as well. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the individual flex items because we can also set properties on the flex items instead of just the container. And that will also change how Flexbox handles the layout. So the first thing we can do is apply some of the things we learned from above. Let's go ahead and make each one of these flex items a flex container. Now, once again, we will be applying properties as a flex item soon, but if we make these a flex container, then we could go ahead and display those numbers centered right in the middle of each box. So if we say display flex, justify content center, and then align items center, and save, now all of our numbers are in the middle of each box. And yes, as you might guess, you could use these three properties to center any element inside of a container, or you could center an element inside of the body, which would be considered a container, the body element of a page. So now you essentially know how to center something in the middle of the page if you want to. Okay, now we have a few properties to look at for flex items. Again, these three properties made each item a flex container of its own, but they are still flex items inside of the larger flex container as well. So what I wanna do besides create some extra space here is go back to the HTML. I'm going to select the last four divs there that have the class box, and I'm going to comment them out for now by pressing Shift, Alt, and the letter A and then saving. And now we'll just have two divs with number one and number two that we can work with in the CSS. So before we put a min width on each box, a min width of 100 pixels, and I'm going to go ahead and comment that out as well. Again, shift alt and the letter A. And now 
no width will be set and you can see they're only getting the width of the content essentially here on the page right now but we can set a property called flex basis and you can give that an absolute value or a percentage if you want so what i'm going to do is give it three well no let's go with 100 pixels again just to compare to what we had so if we'll save now that's essentially giving it a minimum width right now now that could change it it's not the same as min width but that's essentially what it's doing in this case and now another property we can provide is called flex dash grow and we'll set that to one and that's setting this the same value and it's a unitless value but we're setting the same value on both boxes which is essentially saying if they need to grow to fill out the page they will grow the same amount so if we save you can see now our items both grew and they are filling out the page they do have that gap in between but other than that they grew as much as they needed to to take up the rest of the container I'm going to scroll up just a little bit and we're going to use a pseudo selector to select just one of these elements now. So I'll say nth, or I'm sorry, not nth, I need the class first, and class was box, and then it's nth dash child. And let's select the second element here and let's override that flex grow and set it to two. So now this second one should take up more than the first but it's not going to be double and i'll tell you why notice it did grow more than the first but they both have a flex basis of 100 pixels so what we're telling the elements to do here with flex grow is after the 100 pixels so each element gets their 100 pixels then whatever is left the one that has flex grow two is going to get twice as much of that extra space as the element that has flex grow one. So it's saying whatever space is left, you take two for every one that I take essentially. Now the other one to consider is flex shrink. Now before we get to flex shrink, notice we currently have flex wrap still set. So once they get to where they can't fit in that 100 pixel size, they essentially wrap down to two rows here with our current setup. We're going to have to really remove that wrap setting so we can see what flex shrink does for us. So I'm going to select grow here, control D to select the second grow and then change them both to shrink. So now we have flex shrink in place. I'm going to scroll back up to our container and instead of wrap, I'm going to set no wrap. So now with the larger value here of shrink two, our second box is set to shrink more than the first box. And this might be easier to see if we make the boxes larger as well. So let me come out here as far as I can for the page with DevTools open and maybe set these to, let me try 250 pixels and see if that fits inside the screen we have. Yep, so that works. Right now they look like they're basically equal size, but as we shrink the page down, we should see the one on the right, and we do. Number two is getting smaller than number one. So that is because number two has a larger value of flex shrink than number one. So it's the same concept as flex grow, except now we're shrinking and that's preventing the overflow out of the box, that shrinkage is what that does. So I wanted to eliminate the wrap or it would go ahead and wrap instead of shrink at some point. So there we go for flex grow and flex shrink. Flex basis is giving that size basis, but notice over here, we are now shrinking below 250 pixels here for number two. So just like flex grow lets something extend above the basis, flex shrink let something shrink below the basis. So either way, now that we've covered all three of those different properties, we can put all of them into a shorthand as well. So here with the 250 pixels, I guess I'll keep that. We can just say flex. The first value is grow. The second value is shrink. And the third value is basis. So we could do that. And remember, we could also put something over here like a percentage let's say maybe 40 percent see if that works out for us that's about the same and then we could do the same here so we could say flex two for grow two for shrink 
and 40% here as well. Now when we save, they look the same size, but if we grow, number two is going to get a little larger than number one, and if we shrink, number two is going to get a little smaller than number one, although they're both shrinking quite a bit right there. And that could be because I'm using a percentage. As we get down, it's still just taking up 40%. Let's go back to a set value, an absolute value. We should be able to see this example just a little bit better for the shrinkage. So number two gets smaller than number one. Yep, it was because I was using that relative 40% before. So when it grows, Number two still gets a little bit larger. Let me close DevTools. Well, if I close DevTools, I won't be able to pull it over at all. But number two is larger than number one here. It's just a little harder to see. Maybe if I change the absolute value again to 150 pixels. Yep, number two got even larger there. But then as we shrink it down, number two does get smaller than number one. Okay, with that complete, I'm going to go back to the HTML and uncomment those other four divs. Shift, Alt, and the letter A once again to uncomment after we highlight them. Now you can see number two shrank more than the other divs because we have it set up to shrink more if it needs to right here with our nth child. So we could remove that or we could just leave it for now. But there is another property I want to cover and it won't impact it, so I will just leave that. And this would be order. So let's go ahead and change the order of this second child as well. And let's say order is going to be four and save. Now look what happened. It has the highest number, so it went to the end. It didn't go to where the fourth element is. It actually went to the end. However, if we say order zero, it's going to be right back where it was. But if we want it at the beginning, we could say order minus one, and now two is there. Now, if you are using this order property on individual elements, and then you're also using something like row reverse that we had available up here, and let's change this back to wrap as well. And now if we switch this to row reverse, you might be thinking you were going to move number two to the very beginning, but we didn't. We moved it to the right, and it's to the right of the first row, and that is because we reversed it. So essentially, it was here at the beginning, and then we reversed the row. So if we went ahead and set this back to its normal position with zero, then we would see it's in the middle because it would normally be one, two, three, and now it's three, two, one, so that would just be the same. But we, that is all because we have row reverse at the top. So minus one would take it to the right instead of the left. Likewise, a larger number, say one, totally switched it around and now it's down here at the bottom left. And that is because of row reverse again. So if we go ahead and remove the reverse up here, it may be where we would expect it to be. And that's at the very end of the list now because all of the rest of these would be where they were placed essentially with a value of zero. So that one makes it a larger value than all of the rest of them. So we would give it zero to put it back in place, a higher number above zero to put it at the end, and a number like minus one, something lower than zero, to put it at the beginning. We've covered a lot of Flexbox properties today, and we will be building some things with it in the future. But right now, I think the best way for you to get some practice with it, besides just playing around with it in your own HTML and CSS, is to go to this website called Flexbox Froggy, and it's got 24 challenges to help you learn Flexbox. And if I expand it out, I think it looks a little bit better in the full screen. There we go. And you can work through these 24 challenges and learn how to place the frog on the lily pad with Flexbox. And there's some good challenges in there and it will get you thinking about the different ways to use the different properties that we've just reviewed for Flexbox. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection. And a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you. And thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.